Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening. It's getting late. Um, I have no disclosures. Severe rigid scoliosis is the best defined as a curve that's above 90, and to be rigid as well has to have a flexibility of less than 25%. So this is a group of uh, patients who have a deformity of various etiologies and may have also been exposed to failed or complicated surgeries. Um, when you're assessing patients with severe scoliosis, I mean, the, the same principles of assessment of any scoliosis applies, but there are certain things that worth, are worth attention. It makes sense to look at nutritional status of these patients who with severe scoliosis can have like a vertical collapse of their bodies and they don't have enough space for their abdominal organs that pushes the, the, the diaphragm or stents diaphragm up. So that affects their ability to eat uh, and uh, it also affects their respiratory function. So this needs to be addressed. Also, um, some of them have congenital anomalies or may have other comorbidities that needs to be assessed. And finally, of course, the psychosocial uh, burden of such deformities um, uh, on them and on their families. Um, regarding spine assessment, it's, um, you look at the overall uh, posture of the patient, the way he walks, the way she walks or stands, um, and also you look at the deformity components, the balance, uh, the truncal shift, the rib hump, the um, waist asymmetry, the shoulder and pelvis levels, and the, and the scars of previous surgeries. It all, you also look at the neurological status, and unfortunately you may have patients with neurological problems uh, and uh, you have to address them. Pain is expected in many of these patients and some particular attention to the, the idea of a thoracopelvic impingement where the rib cage hits against the iliac crest. Uh, and uh, looking at the etiology also helps uh, because it will help you plan your surgery. Regarding radiological assessment, again, full length x-rays, bending and so forth, CT and MRI to look at anchors and to make sure that there are no abnormal uh, cord tethering or any uh, diastematomyelia, but also uh, for tra for flexibility, traction films are very important. The the, the traction films help uh, assess flexibility because um, it, it shows the best uh, degree of flexibility possible, and also because traction is a mechanism of correction in these patients. It also helps assess the anatomy in the anchor sites. Look at this x-ray. This is a standing x-ray of a patient. You can't really see much of anchors here uh, except these top pedicles. But when you have a traction film, you have a chance to see more of anatomy. Of course, CT helps as well, but the, the traction films help you see more of anatomy. And when you're planning your surgery, you should have goals for your surgery. Um, don't get overwhelmed about the, about the x-rays. Uh, don't think that you're going to do a, a segmental or vertebral derotation or any of that. Huh? You, you should have realistic goals. And the goals are to achieve balance, both in coronal and sagittal, have level shoulders and level pelvis, uh, deal with the rib hump, uh, obtain loin symmetry, which uh, loin asymmetry is very disfiguring, and finally, ab achieving the above with the least possible complications. And to achieve such a correction uh, in these patients, you have to form, perform some form of release. You want to undo this or to allow the mobilized segments of the spine to get some correction. And uh, so many lists, a big list of uh, possible releases, anterior, posterior releases, concave rib osteotomies, or the application of any of the uh, types of uh, uh, spinal osteotomies. But at the end, and to me, these severe rigid scoliosis would fall into three categories. These three categories of management will, will help uh, me decide which of which will have, which patient will have which of these. And these are, they, they either have a release, and this would involve either a posterolateral discectomy or anterior release uh, associated with multiple osteotomies, posterior element osteotomies. That's the group one. Second group, will, those are patients who have vertebral, uh, will require vertebral body osteotomies. And these are patients who are either have angular deformities or patients who have predominantly a sagittal uh, deformity. And finally, patients who require traction. This is my way of looking at these, these patients. Um, let's have a few examples here. For anterior release, anterior release is done open, uh, thoracoscopic. Now, um, being done with uh, uh, for um, uh, with uh, extra pleural approach that I will show you in a minute. 
But I mean, this is something that has went out of favor. I mean, I remember when I started doing uh, idiopathic scoliosis, any curve above 70 would have had an anti-release. But because of pedicle, uh, old pedicle screw instrumentation, this powerful instrumentation allows good correction, uh, anti-release is coming out of favor. But uh, look at this. I mean, this is a very severe curve in a 26-year-old who had previous surgery, was infected, removed the implants, and we get into this disaster with truncal shifts and with a huge rib hump. And uh, this is a traction film that shows some correction at the secondary curve at the lumbar spine, but not much at the level of the, of the, uh, of the, the thoracic spine. So at this case, because this was actually an ant multiple, um, she had anterior surgery as well, so we did an anterior, not release, but rather an enter multiple anterior osteotomies to undo the, the, the fusions at the front. And this is her post-operative x-ray after after two years post-op, and this is after doing a posterior stage with, uh, with, uh, um, uh, with sublaminar wires at the apex. And um, you can see an, uh, quite a significant improvement um, in her overall uh, balance and alignment. So this is a, a young lady who gained 11 centimeters of vertical height, and she's, she's, she continues to be a very happy woman um, with this. And if you compare this with the pre-op, you know the kind of achievement that has been achieved with this surgery. Now, um, a favor, a, another interesting technique is to, instead of doing a thoracotomy, you can, you can actually use, uh, do this like a, an extra pleural approach with, with a posterolateral discectomy. And when you, you actually uh, use the bed where you do a costectomy in these severe patients, severe deformity patients, so you can use the bed of the costectomy and work extra pleurally and do multiple anterior discectomies. This is an ex another example. This is a 20-year-old guy who I saw like a few months ago and had neglected congenital scoliosis with a major curve measuring 115 that went down to 100 um, on traction films. And uh, this is his clinical uh, photographs. Um, and you can see the, the, the severity of the deformity. And this is his post-op x-rays doing having underwent multiple pontes convex costectomy and then posterolateral discectomies at five levels through the, this multiple costectomy uh, bed. Uh, and uh, um, um, the, the anchors used here are the sublaminar wires. I find um, I'm an old fashioned guy who was trained to do um, uh, sublaminar wires. I do AIS now with, with old pedicle screw instrumentation, but I believe that wires are very good. They, 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 can, they can give you very good correction and allow traction on your apex in such severe and deformed vertebrae where it's very hard to put pedicle screws here, here, and I don't think it's a smart thing to force pedicle screws in such a severely rotated spine. Anyway, this is a patient that uh, uh, this is his pre-op compared to the post-op, and this is his clinical photographs after the surgery. Uh, you can compare this at the front and at the back, and you can see how much he's been improved. Um, Concave rib osteotomy is something that, again, is um, forgotten. We have actually revived that. We had a publication here in 2007. We have, um, we've been doing um, uh, concave rib osteotomies for curves above 70 in replacement to, uh, to anterior release. We had some good results at the time, but honestly, I've stopped doing it because I worry too much of interfering on one side of the chest uh, while I'm already doing uh, costectomies and interfering with the other side of the chest. So I've stopped doing it. We've published that. We have had some good results. This is a case out of the publication. Uh, so I apologize about the quality of the x-rays. Now, this is group one. Group two is the ones that require vertebral body osteotomies. And when I mean by vertebral body osteotomies, I mean uh, osteotomies of type three, four, five, and six. So PSO and its extensions or VCR and its multiple levels. This is, a, this is a 12 year old who has a severe early onset scoliosis, has got a congenital element on it, neglected in management, and she's 12 year old. She has a cervical thoracic bad curve, and uh, she, you can see her with a quite disfigured. Um, I saw her a few months ago, and uh, this is her traction film, so there was some improvement in her. Uh, coronal plane deformity on traction uh, and also some improvement in her kyphosis. So there is an element of kyphosis as well as, um, um, as an element of severe scoliosis extending into the lower cervical spine. And um, we, we did surgery here using multiple posterior ponte, ponte osteotomies uh, and a posterior instrumentation of C5 to to uh, L1, uh, she's overall balanced. Um, she gained uh, 10 centimeters of vertical height, 
Um, and um, if you compare these x-rays with the pre-op, that is the comparison, and you look at the uh, uh, post-op clinical photographs, they're actually quite impressive. So this is a 13-year-old boy who uh, was treated elsewhere with an AI that looks very innocent and very simple with this funny-looking instrumentation in some other uh, place. And um, as expected, because of the wrong selection of fusion levels, he had a pullout of the instrumentation at the top. This broke down the skin, and the surgeon decided to remove all the implants. And guess what? Nine years later, he comes to my office like this. A camel. Horrible stuff. Huh? So this is again a patient with uh, a main plane of deformity being sagittal. Um, uh, kyphosis is measuring around 124. Um, and um, what we did here is a T7 uh, VCR uh, with instrumentation from T2 to L4. Um, anatomy is uh, very difficult to find um, at anchor points. We managed to get our hooks at the top with the sublaminar wires, a good salvage implants, um, and a VCR at T7. Um, a huge improvement in appearance. You may not fall in love with the x-ray, but look at the appearance. The clinical appearance has changed uh, uh, totally. This is another patient who um, is, a, is, a, is a patient coming from Chad. She was, she was living in Saudi Arabia, and she had surgery there by a surgeon, and uh, she got infected, decomp removal of the implants, and she gets into this disaster. Um, she is a neurofibromatosis patient. That's, that explains why she has such a short and, and a dis, um, a horrible uh, kyphosis after the removal of the implants. She's a neurofibromatosis patient. And um, four years later, she comes like this. Uh, and uh, we do a, a PSO um, um, with uh, um, attachment approximately with hooks and wires with a, an excellent correction on the, both the coronal and sagittal plane. This is another patient who is also a neurofibromatosis. This is a really challenging patient. This is a patient who, who uh, has a neurofibromatosis with duralactasia from T11 to L3, had two previous surgeries in France, and uh, she came back to Cairo. Uh, she was a, um, an engineer student studying, studying engineering in the university. Um, because of this severe pelvic obliquity, um, she was not uh, going back to university. She was staying at home, uh, getting uh, psychological, uh, t uh, psychiatric treatment because of severe depression. And uh, when you look at the, the problem there, you will define that the, the real issue here was the, the pelvic obliquity. The pelvic obliquity gave her uh, in apparent leg length inequality that allowed her to walk in a very funny way. The only way is to f bend the knee that seemed longer, so it was walking in, in a very bad uh, gait. And uh, by knowing this, um, uh, we decided to do an um, asymmetric PSO at L4 immediately, immediately below the, the, the area of the duralactasia and uh, corrected the pelvic obliquity quite nicely. Um, she has, uh, we've operated on her five years ago. She's, she went back to university, finished university, and she is one happy woman. And you can see the improvement, the, the massive improvement, not just in the pelvic obliquity, but of the coronal uh, balance as well. Finally, the last group is the group of traction. Traction, so many things to talk about traction. We can spend an hour talking about traction, the values of it, when to do it, which weights, for how long, after releases or without releases, intraoperative or preoperative only, all that. Um, um, Bawachi um, uh, and with his uh, group in uh, Ghana um, have, have proposed the classification and also have looked at the risk stratification for patients undergoing traction for severe scoliosis. Um, these are um, scoliosis patients with very, very severe deformities, much worse than the previous ones. This is a, um, an example of a 22-year-old with a severe uh, scoliosis, severe deformity, focus uh, 2P, um, f um, which is a half omega, a, a coronal cop angle of over, over about 180, and uh, with a kyphosis as well above 100. Now, this is um, a patient that will certainly need traction with a number of values for traction, improving the nutritional status and improving the respiratory function as well. And uh, he could only um, um, tolerate 25% of his body weight. Okay. And, uh, um, okay. 
So anyway, this is the surgery. We did the surgery here. We did multiple pontes um, uh, and uh, uh, posterolateral discectomies and a convex costoplasty after the traction, used sublaminar wires. And um, we've got pretty good the correction of the curve compared to the pre-op x-rays. Uh, and this is his uh, clinical photographs pre-op and post-op. So the take-home message really here is that these severe rigid scoliosis patients um, require accurate assessments and precise planning of the treatment. In my, uh, in my way of thinking, these fall into three categories, the release group, the vertebral body osteotomy group, and those who require traction. I thank you very much for your attention.